guys, welcome to another episode of Midnight Madness Chats with Hardman. I've got a very special guest on the air tonight. Um, yeah, introduce yourself. Hello, I'm uh, Chris Slade, drummer of this parish and many other parishes and lots of bands. <laughs> and I suppose the main one you'll know me for is ACDC. Tell me, let's 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 go back. Let's go way back. Let's start from the beginning. What inspired you to pick up the sticks and become, you know, a drummer? Um, my brother was my older brother Danny was in uh, a street marching band, and he used to bring his drum home on weekends, and. Uh, uh, he taught me a few licks because I cleaned the drum, uh, younger brother, you know, and uh, he taught me a few things. So it was, uh, you know, it was a good start. And and if you don't like my drumming, blame my brother Danny. <laughs> yeah. No, well, you know, you have to have quite a bit of energy to, you know, go up the, on the stage with... Uh, uh, ACDC and so, so I think your drumming is quite decent. Yeah, you've got to have that uh, certain energy level, of course. But, you know, um, Malcolm Young, you know, made my job so easy because uh, <laughs> he's such a, such a driver without speeding up. Mm. Um, you know, he's the best I've ever worked with. So he made my job so easy. Oh, that's good to hear. Uh, tell me about the experience of playing with uh, Manfred Mann's Earth Band. Uh, how you got involved? Tell me the story of the band, and it's it's quite a different vibe. Um, Manfred called me one day. He got my number from somewhere, and asked if I'd be interested in forming a band. And of course, I said yes. I'd. Uh, I'd been finished with Tom Jones about six months by that time. I was with Tom Jones right through the 60s, uh, seven years altogether. And um, Manfred called me and said, would you like to form a band? And he said, I know a um, singer, guitarist, do you know a bass player? Which I did, which was uh, Colin Patton. And... Uh, we formed a band, although Manfred has never said, this is the band. <laughs> never, <laughs> never once. Um, okay. And we had seven years in Earth Band. I had seven years in Earth Band. And tell me, tell me about the writing process as a drummer. Uh, you know, we, there's like this general joke where we don't let the, you know, drummer write the songs. Uh, tell me about the process and the writing. And, uh, Not in this, Phil Collins. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> um, I don't know about the process. I started writing uh, about two and a half years ago. I've always written lyrics or poetry, whichever way you look at it. Um, and I uh, I found out two and a half years ago I could write melodies, and the melodies weren't just um, singing melodies. They were bass lines, they were string lines, they were guitar arpeggios, all sorts of things were coming out. Uh, vocal harmonies. Um, so it became a very interesting project. So, and that's where this Timescape album came from. From okay. uh, me starting that we've all the band, Chris Slade Timeline, have always recorded, always recorded uh, for 10 years now. We've been recording, so we've got plenty in the, in the can for, uh, but we usually recorded covers. Very mm. rarely did we, um, to try an original of uh, of any of the band, and then suddenly I developed this uh, 
this thing of writing melodies, and it came quite easily and organically. Um, and as far as getting, um, just getting things out of the air, actually, they just come to you. I, I, I've no idea how. And I've heard many, many writers say that also. Um, mm -hmm. They just come. It's the muse, you know, hits you. Mm -hmm. And you might get a couple of notes, you know, da, da, da. And that develops into a whole song. I, I've no idea how that happens. And it's uh, not a conscious thing. Like if I'm, I'm going to bed, I go, oh, uh, I've got to go get my phone because uh, um, I've got an idea. I'll be back in five minutes. <laughs> yeah, um, that's that. That I, I also do that. And sometimes, you know, you're laying in bed and it's like two o'clock in the morning and you're like, oh, I've got this idea. I need to write it down somewhere. And then sometimes yeah. you fall back, back to sleep and then you never remember. It's, and uh, you, you just can't remember it. You just can't. It's impossible. You think, oh, that's easy. I'll remember that. You never do. You <laughs> never do. Um, yeah. I don't know why that is either. I think it's just in your brain. You think, oh, it's only la da da di. Uh, I remember that easily. No, nope, you won't. And if you remember something, it won't be the same, will it? You know, it's just, uh, it's just not. It doesn't have the uh, freshness of the original idea. It's yeah. something you, something you've worked on. So. Um, I I was very pleased that this has happened. I'm still doing it. Um, so uh, it happens uh, a few times a week, maybe a few times a day sometimes. And uh, I'm very grateful for it, wherever it came from. Um, <laughs> and I've read things about, uh, you know, sometimes when you get a bit older, your brain uh, makes different connections. Mm. And I think it's something to do with that in my case, not in everybody's case. You know, Paul McCartney mm -hmm. was writing melodies and words, you know, from when he was a kid, perhaps. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So he's been at it for, you know, decades and decades. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I remember reading that he uh, got it. It just came to him out of the air. Um. And Beethoven used to say that uh, he used to go in the countryside and he'd hear birds singing or the wind in the trees, stuff like that. Um, and that would give him inspiration to write a melody or something. Um, and, and it does tend to work like that. I hear a car backfiring or driving down the street and I go, oh, how can I use that? Where, what note was that? Where, you know, <laughs> where can it go? Um, and it is like that. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, it's very exciting for me. I wish it had happened 50 years ago, but it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell me, you were saying that you were recording a lot of covers before you started with the original. Do you draw a lot of inspiration from those covers? And uh, can you give me a few names of the covers covers you guys were working on? Uh, not really, to be honest. Um, you know, those those covers are all written like the ACDC, who are genius writers. You know, they they write uh, they write pop songs and they play them heavy. Um, <laughs> you know, that's a trick, man. Um, a good trick. Um, and they got themselves moved into the heavy section of the record uh, business uh, on purpose. You know, they just said, we're a heavy band, which they are. And uh, they got themselves put into the heavy metal category in all record stores around the world. So... Uh, it it makes a difference. The image of things makes a difference. But they're genius mm. songwriters anyway. Yeah. Mm. And if you listen, they are pop songs. They've got hooks. They've got verses, you know, same as any other song. Um, but they just, they heavy them up. Mm. It's, uh, 
the exact opposite of um, Hit Me Baby One More Time, Britney Spears. <laughs> that started off as a heavy metal song. Oh, that's and interesting. She took it. Uh, I think it was a Swedish heavy or uh, Scandinavian heavy metal band. And they wrote it. And uh, she took it and made a pop song out of it. So, uh, you know, it's uh, horses for courses. It's doesn't matter how you do it, as long as you do it. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I, I actually learned something today. I didn't know that about Britney Spears and Hit Me yeah. Baby one more time. That's cool. Uh, tell me, what was the most challenging uh, song on the record with uh, My Friends Man's Earth Band? Yes. Um, there were two songs from Earth Band on the original side. And I did that because I wrote the lyrics and they were both minor hit songs. So I thought maybe they'll become minor hit songs again. Who knows? Um so Joybringer, and, uh, which is based on the uh, Planet Suite by Gustav Holst. And uh, Questions is also a classical piece of music, which Manfred found. Uh, and he said, I've got a great melody for your poem. As I said, I used to, you know, I always wrote poems. So, um, and it was uh, uh, Schubert's third impromptu. Um, I've uh, I've put on the album Schubert's Third Racket, um, a, a la um, Basil Fawlty. I don't know if you've seen Fawlty Towers, but uh, it's uh, you know his wife says, "Turn that racket off." He's listening to classical <laughs> music, and uh, he says, oh, "Okay." So he re reaches over, turns it off, and says, "It's Brahms' Third Racket." <laughs> So, oh, so, uh, <laughs> so um, you yeah, know, that's where I got racket from, which I thought was really funny. Oh, that's, yeah, that's a very cool story. Um, tell me, uh, talking about uh, Manfred's uh, Earth Earth Band compared to ACDC, because I was listening to uh, well, both bands a bit today to get into the mindset. There's quite a big difference in energy. Um, where where Earth Band has sort of a very jazz smooth sound, and while well, ACDC, everyone knows ACDC, it's got that electrical rock. So you, as a drummer, um, going from Earth Band to ACDC, uh, on a on a like performance level, um, you know what 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 did you experience between what was your experience between the two different bands? Um. Yes, they are different. Um, we aspire to be a bit heavier in Earth Band, but um, it didn't work. We just couldn't capture the... Uh, we used to capture it on stage really well, uh, but we couldn't capture it on uh, on record at all, hardly ever. Um, and, of course, it's down to recording techniques or studios or engineers or anything like that. And uh, ACB, DC have been, uh, you know, consistent all the way through. Those two guitars, you know, of Angus and Malcolm are just magic, you know? <laughs> and uh, they're the, the bedrock that everything else goes around. So we didn't have that <laughs> in Man From Man's <laughs> Earth Band, you know? Um, it was a uh, it was a different feel. We are more of a prog rock band. Um, timeline, we can do both because we play ACDC and we play Earth Band and we play Uriah Heep, another example of heaviness, if you like. Um, and we play Asia, which is truly prog rock. Mm. Um, so, you know, it, and I'm lucky that my drumming technique enables me to play all those different styles. Mm. I started with jazz when I was 11 or 12, listening to jazz, of course, in the beginning, uh, because I was very interested in drums, uh, even at that age. 
And uh, there were no pop drummers around, you know. There were, uh, don't forget, this was the 50s and uh, 1950s. And they weren't even called, there weren't any bands around then. There was Pat Boone or uh, Frank Sinatra. Um, you know, there were no no groups of any kind. And then in the 60s, when the Beatles and the Stones started, um, they were called pop groups uh, or beat groups. Uh, nobody was in a band until the 1970s. Um, I think it came from America where people say, hey, we're not a group, man. Or, we're a band. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll try to remember that. And, of course, everybody now calls it a rock band. Um, Angus calls it a rock and roll band. <laughs> so that's his take on ACDC. It's rock and roll. And that's what he loves. Mm. And uh, when I started with Tom Jones in 1963, I was uh, 16 years old, and uh, he was like in his early 20s, and um, I, he wasn't called Tom Jones yet, by the way, and uh, till he, till we both changed our names um, a few years later, but um, it was uh, a great education because we would play. Uh, Little Richard stuff, J. Lee Lewis, you know. Um, and then, and we were all leather jackets and jeans, you know. And Tom would then throw a ballad in, which the audience would just love, because it was usually miners, steel workers, and their families, you know, kids as well. Mm -hmm. And so they, they loved the ballad. To love having to cry to a ballad, you know. <laughs> um, so Tom would throw in something like I believe or something, you know. And uh I had to learn how to play that, all those styles. But my uh, grounding in jazz helped me do that. And it helped me, you know, years later when he when he was Tom Jones, and then uh he got into the cabaret circuit in the States or in first in London. And um, he started working with big bands. And so I knew all about that because I was well into Buddy Rich and, and drummers like that. Um, mm -hmm. I couldn't play like Buddy Rich. I'm not saying that. I'm saying I knew what the style was and how to swing it. Um, because that's that swing still has to be there when you play rock. Mm. You know, as a drummer, you've you still got to swing and uh, you still got to play with feel. If it's rock and roll or rock or jazz, semi jazz, if you like. Mm. Uh, so, you know, it's uh, the 60s was a great time for me to really learn what I was doing rock and roll and jazz type thing mm. so you you were saying you it all started when you were 16 i was speaking to stephen foster uh about a week or two ago uh he's one of the sort of co-producers from lynette skinnett and he said one of the things is when you start as a young musician you get this option and it's, it's never an easy option to choose but if you choose music and music chooses you back you retire at that moment uh, do you agree with that statement? And what do you feel about it? You retire at that moment? So that what... With other words, you, 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 you never get bound by a job. You are living, you, you're, you're living your passion. You are working for your passion. Yes, yes. I've never worked in my life. You know, well, I did. I've had jobs because I had to. Because musicians uh, don't get paid that well, do they? Sometimes. Not at um, all. So uh, I have worked, but uh, yeah, the, the phrase is, you know, if you love your job, you never work a day in your life. And I love drumming. I wanted to be a drummer 
I made a, a vow, you know, I'll be a drummer all my life. I haven't succeeded yet, but I'm I'm working on it. I think you've done pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, tell me, tell me about the the moment that ACDC contacted you the first time to play for ACDC. Um, I before just before ACDC for a year. I was working with Gary Moore. Oh, that's insane. Yeah. And uh, they had the same manager, a guy called Stuart Young, uh, no relation to um, Angus and Malcolm, just the same name. And uh, because he was the manager of Gary Moore, I got the chance when they needed a drummer to audition for ACDC. So uh, that opportunity came along, and I took it. And um, I I went along. It was close to my house, the audition, in Britain at least. They auditioned in America as well. Mm. Um, so it was north of Brighton in the UK. Uh, and it was about an hour from my house. So I went there, and it was uh, okay. There was there was uh, the day the days before I got there. There were uh, Dick the drum tech told me this. You know, there'd been other people in, top top names, really really top top names, had been in. Uh, for the uh, like four or five days before me, and Angus and Malcolm took two chairs, put it ten feet from me in on my drum kit, and said, "No pressure, of course." And said, um, <laughs> "You know, uh, okay, we'll do back in black. Uh, you count in." Uh, all right, guys. Uh, tick, 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 gang. Da gang. Yeah, it's uh, no pressure at all. And they're 10 <laughs> feet from me uh, playing their guitars, you know. And Cliff's in one corner and Brian's in the other corner. Um, and uh, at the end of it, we, it was about an hour or an hour and a half, something. So they, you know, they gave me a good crack of the whip. And um, I thought, well, that was uh, pretty ordinary from you, Slade. And uh, why did you say that? Why did you say this? Why did you do that? Why did you play it like that? Why didn't you play it like this? Well, what's the matter with you? So uh, I was uh, driving home. I packed the drums up after audition. And they said, oh, okay, we'll let you know, Chris. Okay. So all the way home, I'm going, Slade, you idiot. <laughs> yeah. And I was so preoccupied with uh, berating myself that I got lost. I was an hour from my house. I got lost. <laughs> so I thought, oh, I'll ring the missus and uh, tell her that, uh, you know, I'll be back soon. And uh, so I rang and she said, uh, how do you do? I said, really bad, really bad. Uh, I'll tell you all about it when, uh, when I'm back. I just got lost. Um, okay. So I got home to the house, half an hour away from where I was. And um, she came up the path and she said, uh, Oh, so you did badly, did you? I said, yeah, it, was, it wasn't as good as it could have been. She said they just called to say you got the gig. <laughs> oh, wow. Nice. So you were self-doubting yourself for nothing? Yes. You know, I thought it was valid, of course, you know. Um, and I could have done a better audition. But, you know, I, I played with as much feel as I could. Uh, which is very important, and as much swing as I could, which, of course, is very important. 
And uh, it was enough by the looks of it. So uh, I was very pleased about that. And uh, I, Dick again told me afterwards that they had tried out a hundred top drummers throughout the world. And I was I was number hundred. Um, and uh, uh, people from other bands used to call them and say, "Hey guys, don't tell my band, but I really want to try out for you." You know, <laughs> so you know there were there. I'm sure there were thousands of drummers who wanted to make that call mm -hmm. but didn't know how to, but. You know, everybody in your uncle wanted to be in ACDC AC because even then they weren't as big as they were like a few years before, but they were still a big band, you know, and had a great reputation, of course, and always have had. Mm. And they're always great on stage and nothing ever goes wrong. Um, and they start bang on time as well, you know. Mm. Um, it was uh, it was a fantastic experience that led to a live at Donington album, um, in you know in front of like one hundred and fifty thousand people or something, and uh, it, it was great. It was a wonderful experience. So tell tell me about the experience uh, then when you rejoined ACDC for the Rocco burst to a re to a replacing uh, Phil Wright. Um, tell me about the tour. Tell me about your favorite moments of the tour, and uh, yeah, tell me your experience. Uh, the whole tour is a favorite moment, to be honest. I I <laughs> I don't um, you know it's eighty thousand people a night, the Rocco bus tour. Um, we played big tour, big shows uh, the first time around, um, but you know this uh, the rock or bus thing was stadiums worldwide, minimum eighty thousand people. There was a place in Canada, I remember, was uh, I think it's a building and it holds uh, something like one hundred fifty thousand. Uh, it's massive indoor st studio, uh, stadium. And um, uh, ACDC, when I was with them, on the first, one of the first dates, it was in Austria. And uh, they hold the record still, I believe, of 150,000 people just to see one band like they get that sort of uh size of people uh for a festival with multiple bands and multiple days but this is one day one concert acdc alone and uh that's they insane. hold that record still in austria i think that's insane yeah that's it is I would give what <laughs> what would i give to do that hey yeah. <laughs> um, you know, my first gig with ACDC second time around was playing the Grammys. Um, so we rehearsed for that, of course. Came the night and the manager was there and I said, uh, uh, how many people are, are watching this, you know, this show tonight? And he said, oh, I think it's something like... Uh, 800 million i said what he said no it's okay <laughs> it's only it's only 80 million i said oh, i feel much better now <laughs> oh it's only 80 million you know <laughs> yeah yeah how many In people fact, how many... i think about 80 i think it was about 80 million actually but it never phases me to be honest all the guys uh it's another day in the office you know mm. And that's the way, the attitude you've got to have. Um, and I luckily, I've had that all the way through. Mm. Uh, I'm never nervous. And um, I was playing 
with Tom Jones and the Count Basie Orchestra. I played Madison Square Gardens for a week when I was 19 or something. Mm -hmm. So it's it's another day in the office, you know? Mm -hmm. You can't go, yeah. oh, wow. If you looked around at 100,000 people, you'd freeze. When you've done it a few I times, you can you can do it and just look, you know. Now, I, I tend to also uh, this this is what helps me get through a show. I tend to not be able to play sober because I freeze up and become like a stick. Oh, I'm a guitarist myself, like you can see from behind me. Right. Anyway, who's the who's the your personal favorite artist that you've ever worked with? You said uh, you worked with Gary Moore, obviously ACDC, Tom Jones, David Gilmour, and Jimmy Page. Uh, you've played with a bunch of great musicians throughout your career. Who would you say was your most favorite and influential musician that you played with? That I played with? Um, that would be Jaco Pastorius. Okay. <laughs> On bass. Um, I jammed with him once, uh, and it was fun, just me and him, and it was just amazing. Weather Report's one of my favorite bands anyway. Um, there's my jazz leadings, you know, and, uh, you know, Jacko, I think, was, uh, was a genius, was unique, um, and just the, uh, the base of doom, you know, of his that was... You know, that he used was a tremendous sound. Um, and it still is a tremendous sound. I listen to it mm. quite often. Um, so he would be a sort of musical hero of mine, if you like. That's um, awesome. Yeah, I actually know, know of him. Fucking amazing bassist. So I've got a few more questions, but before we move on, uh, I've decided to make things a bit interesting uh, for the viewers. Uh, I developed a little game um, that I would like to play with you. So I'm going to give you one word, and you have to respond with one word without thinking about it. <laughs> I'm not very good at this, but let's. Uh, I'll give it a go. Okay, drums. Noise. <laughs> ACDC Nice <laughs> Tour bus Tour bus Yeah um, Home Okay uh, Tom Jones Ah, great singer uh, a Guitar Guitar Yeah uh, Nice <laughs> Um Drum solo. Nice. <laughs> Tribute band. Tribute band. I think it's I think it's very relevant that uh, people can work, and if it's in a tribute band, no matter what the tribute is, it's it's uh, allowing musicians to work, which is very very important. You know, you need money for your family. You need money to buy guitars. You need <laughs> anything, you know? Um, uh, so to me, they're very important. So on, on that note, uh, tell me about the tribute band, uh, Chris Slade Steel Circle. Oh, it was um, it was a project like Timeline. But it, the difference was it was in America. I was living in America at the time. And uh, a guitarist friend came up to me and said, "Yeah, I've got an idea. Why don't we, uh, why don't we try putting a tribute band together? You know, well, ACDC. I know all the chords. I've been playing it for years, and uh, I know some people who do it. So that's where that came from. It was just working, you know. Okay. Yeah, well, that's 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 uh, interesting. And of all the festivals you mentioned that you played." The Grammys, and you mentioned you played um, uh, the biggest uh, single band show that ACDC has ever played. Out of all the festivals and shows with all the various of artists, bands you've played with, which one is your personal favorite? Um, I always give the same answer to this. 
There's no favourite. It's like the children. And I've got three of them uh, and grandkids. So, uh, you know, the bands, are, it's very diplomatic, but it's true. There's no favourite band. They are all different, you know. Um, I had some great experience with ACDC. I had some great experience with David Gilmore. I had some great experiences with the firm, with Jimmy Page and Paul Rogers. Um, Tom Jones was great, 60s. Earth Band was great, 70s. I've just been very lucky. Even 80s was good. It wasn't very prominent in my career, but I worked with some really good people. And, uh, you know, all the way through, I did Gary Moore, uh, sorry, Gary Newman in the 80s. And uh, and Denny Lane also from Wings. I was in a band with him. Um, they've all been really professionally good gigs. Uh, Mick Ralph's from Bad Company. Um, and it keeps going on. I can't remember. Frankie Miller was another good thing. That was just a record, but wasn't a band, but um, he's a great singer, Frankie. Yeah. Um, Tommy. Just all, you know, they're all great experiences. Um, and you got to get on with people. That's the whole point of being in a band. It's no good hating the bass player, you know. Um, <laughs> you've got you to have a beer afterwards. Uh, and before he tears your head off, um, <laughs> you, you better be a nice guy, <laughs> otherwise he will tear your head off. <laughs> uh, Toby, and after all these years of drumming, I mean, you've been you have a good five dick No, it's now about seven dick No, seven decades of music behind you. It's about. Uh, I've been professional for sixty years. So that's six decades of music. How does a drummer of your uh, standard, you know, I still keep fresh and keep up with, you know, keeping sharp with drumming and all that. Um, you know, I have no idea. I just do what I do. Uh, I don't sit down and practice on the kit and people go, oh, yeah, I know you can tell, can't you? You know, he hasn't <laughs> practiced for years. Yes, you know. Um, with ACDC, I sit there for 30 minutes every day practicing with a metronome, uh, my right hand on a hi-hat playing 16s or even 30 seconds um, for half an hour out of fear, actually, because uh, I was afraid of screwing up when it came to Let the Be Rock. Um, and I've always done that when I've been with ACDC. And Angus last time asked me to play a bit straighter. Um, not he didn't want the sixteens. He he wanted the uh, more like fours or eights. Um, so I tempered that a little bit, but only during the solo. He was fine during the song, but he during his solo he wanted a bit more sparse, and that was only the second time around. So uh, you have to be adaptable, you know. Do you have a message that you would like to uh, give to young drummers that, you know, are starting out now and um, that have their whole futures ahead of them? Um, the only advice that's relevant is practice, man. Practice. Every day, if you can. I used to come home from school when I was about 12 and practice until my parents came home from work, both of them. Um, then I'd stop. And what a drummer needs, you'd think, oh, a drum kit. No, good neighbors. <laughs> because well, uh, if they complain, you're screwed. Well, I, I play in a metal band. We're, we're quite of the new modern heavy metal bands. Um, and uh, I must admit, I haven't had one complaint yet. And uh, 
So good neighbors is a, a good thing to have. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've got um, uh, a neighbor that plays drums because I hear him practicing. And do you think I mind? <laughs> no. Um, right. You know, go for it, mate. You know? And in fact, well, we... I, I now, I've never met him. I've seen him, but I haven't met him. So I know who he is now, you know. So he'll be getting a letter bomb in a few days. <laughs> <laughs> now, where do you currently stay? Um, UK at the moment. I mean, I've lived in a, in uh, the States. Uh, me and my wife have lived in the States. Um, and, you know, that was good for a time. I've lived in, uh, and my daughter lives in Seattle. Um, and I, I've lived in uh, Los Angeles and uh, Las Vegas. So, uh, you know, I know a lot about the States. Where are you right now? So I, I'm, I'm South African. Um, yeah, I could tell. I, I work, uh, I work for Midnight Madness as a, this is like a fun project I do, um, with my spare time. Um, I, I, I met Michael Tiffany a few years ago. He used to play our band's music and, I started chatting to him and I said to him, hey, you know, I like what you do, but don't you maybe want to try something new? And he said, yeah, but he doesn't have the time and he doesn't really, he sometimes sits in on these interviews, but he he doesn't always have the time or the means to do it. So I said, but I would love to. And to be honest, to have this opportunity to speak to great musicians, you know, is is it's so fun. It's actually like this little chat we had is like almost like a live performance for me. It gives me the same sort of rush, you know. So, oh, great. Yeah. so where where are you living? Um, where is your studio? So my studio is in South Africa. Uh, ah, in okay. right. Yeah. So we we were supposed to travel to the UK. We were actually supposed to fly to the UK yesterday. But our tour got postponed because the UK is going through a cost of living crisis at the moment. Yeah, yeah. True. Yeah, so unfortunately our tour was postponed and we might be coming next year. Um, to We want to hit the Welsh circuit, so we want to go to Scotland, England and then uh, Wales. Uh, but we're not going to uh, Northern Ireland or Ireland itself. Um, but yeah, so we're still planning that tour with... But yeah, I really, really want to come visit the UK. I, I love the, the atmosphere and the people are very nice. They can be, definitely. Well, people can be very nice everywhere. I always say people are people, you know. Um, I like meeting people. I love to travel and meet people. And I'm still doing that. And it's uh, very important to me. And I think yeah. music, music keeps you young. Um, I got two sons, and they keep me uh, up with what's going on, um, and uh, they tell me about new drummers and new people who are coming along. Um, so you know, I, I like to keep abreast of things like that. Mm. Uh, I think it's very important, um, yeah. and I've always been like that. So I think it's a it's a very good attitude to have as a musician. You have to be sort of charismatic to survive in the music industry. Because if you don't have people skills or communication skills, I, I think you tend to fall back a little bit. Yep. Yeah, that's very important. That is part of your arsenal, actually. It must be. Um, you can learn all the woodly bits you like on guitar, but if, uh, you know, if you're not, a nice guy, at least to the people you work with, you ain't going to last, man. Um, some people try it and they, they're okay for a few years because it's their band, maybe. Um, and then they discover that uh, people don't like them very much. <laughs> Luckily, yeah, that, that... this band has been together 12 years, timeline. 
So, uh, you know, we know each other very, very well. Tell me about the future of, of your current band and, and what, what are you guys busy with at the moment? Um, we've just been doing gigs. Uh, we were in Italy just a few days ago, I think two or three days ago. Um, and uh, a few months ago, we were in Poland. So we drive, we drive everywhere, by the way, we don't fly very often because um, we like to use our own equipment. I like to use my own rock or bus drum kit. Okay. Um, and because uh, it's a great DW kit, it's just wonderful. And it's tuned perfectly as far as I'm concerned. Um, and, uh, you know, I just love to travel. We were in Czechoslovakia earlier this year. Sorry, Czech Republic. Um, and we go to Germany a lot, France, Spain, all over Europe. I think it's absolutely. And we, you know, we've been to places, some great places like uh, Prague, for instance, which is, you know, a fantastic place. And you get to see that. Mm. And, uh, you know, I wasn't that interested when I was in school, when I was 10 years old, you know. I wasn't that interested in geography. What's geography? What's geography? Um, you know? But now, and I've been to South America uh, myself. I'm trying to get the uh, timeline there, actually, uh, right now. And... Uh, Hopefully, we can get to Canada and Mexico. So I'm looking forward to that. States is a bit difficult because you need uh, visas, you know that. Mm. And uh, they're difficult to get on time. I've heard horror stories of the American visas turning up two months after the tour is supposed to finish. Um, I, I've got a green card, but the, the, the guys themselves haven't so they would need work work permits but anyway where it's not too difficult we'll go uh, so talking talking about visas you we also had a uk visa nightmare because we were gonna go like i said we were supposed to fly out two days ago and our one guitarist uh they did not want him <laughs> They they kept rejecting him multiple times actually. Uh myself I got rejected once um because they said I do not have enough money to come to the UK. But it was oh, yeah. all, all utter bullshit because um they allowed our drummer, who is a full time musician, to go to the UK and you know musicians don't make a lot of money. And me, who's sort of a manager in a company. They said, no, you don't have enough money. And I was like, what? You can't say that. You, how do you yeah. compare the two? <laughs> you know, I know. You know uh, we, uh, Time Man went to Russia very briefly. And uh, we had to go to the embassy to get our visas. And uh, we went in there and they went, okay, uh, I want complete details of all your bank accounts. And I said, what? They went, yeah, we want to know if you've got enough money. They, I just said, come on, guys, we're not bothering. So we all got up and they said, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. I know you to give us the details of the bank account. Um, you know, uh, here's your here's your visas. <laughs> uh, and it, to me, it wasn't worth all that hassle. Mm -hmm. Look, here's my passport. I'm a law-abiding citizen. I promise I won't spy for Russia, uh, for Britain, I mean. <laughs> um, and uh, please let me in. Pretty, pretty please, sir. And, uh, you know, I was going to take the band. I said, come on, we, we're walking, guys. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> so la last little question that I have for you. Um, obviously, uh, you guys come from a different era of music. 
Um, tell me about modern times. Uh, are you guys on social media? Where can people find you on social media? What do you think of Spotify, YouTube, and all those streaming platforms? Uh, first of all, we're on uh, this the Chris Slade timeline. That's the title. And uh, we're on Facebook. You can find us on Facebook. There's also chrisslade.com, um, which speaks for itself. And uh, there's a few Chris Slade things around, actually, but only I only bother with some of them. Um, and there's World, uh, sorry, Brave Words Records. And you can, people can get the album Timescape on that. It's just come out like two weeks or something. Um, and uh, I'm very optimistic about the future. Um, okay. So talk to me again at the end of the year, which <laughs> see how optimistic <laughs> I was. <laughs> now that's awesome. And just a quick thing, uh, streaming platforms, do you like streaming platforms or not? Uh, do I like them? Yeah, if people, if people like them, I like them. <laughs> uh, it, it's a way to access the music. I prefer, personally, I prefer solid things like CDs and vinyl. Um, that's my own personal preference, and I'm old-fashioned. I know that. Um, the the band use stream and stuff because they're only in their 30s, you know? Mm. Um, so they, they use streaming stuff all the time. But... Uh, um, I don't think I've ever streamed anything, actually. And I still like books, like old-fashioned books that you have to turn the page. Oh, dear. <laughs> All that work just to read. Um, well, so I'm, I'm very old-fashioned. But hip. <laughs> old-fashioned, but hip. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> But thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me. Uh, I really had great fun. Uh, you're a very interesting person to talk to. And man, you've had a career. And yeah, uh, well done on everything. And uh, congratulations on the new project you guys are busy with. And uh, good luck to the future. Thank you very much. And the same to you. I hope your trip comes off and it works the way it's supposed to. Hopefully I'll see you at a crowd. In the crowd. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, I've been hard man. All the best, man. All the best.